I'm sure that if you look around you today, with all the signs out there, pandemic, political turmoil, the problems with our weather, our climate, so many things point to the end. But one of the things that the Bible tells us about the end times is this thing called the rapture. And I want to be able to explain as much as possible because there's, there's a lot of confusion out there about what the rapture is, whether it, it is biblical, it is not. So, you know, if you will just spend the next 30 minutes with me, I believe God will help you to begin to understand a little bit more and clear up some of this confusion. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you help us to see what the Bible has spoken, what the Bible has given us so that we can understand what we need to understand in these end times. And I pray that you make it clear, O oh God, some of these teachings so that we can develop a hope and understanding, a, a preparedness to be caught up with you in these times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 39, I begin to talk about end time events. I'll be spending uh, a few weeks on and off here and there in this verse with uh, um, Revelations, the end time church, and between some of the practical applications in our Christian life for the end times. And I'll be dealing with the rapture. I'll be talking about the tribulation in another period. I'll be talking about the millennium and uh, some of these other events that um, confuse many Christians. Uh, the main scripture that um, is used for a theology of a rapture is in First Thessalonians 4. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of the Lord, and the day in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So what is the rapture? What is described here in this passage of Scripture by Paul is um, an event that has yet to happen, but soon will. Um, the description itself is about believers at a time that they're not expecting will be called up by Christ, will be caught up in the air with Christ, and um, we will leave the, the, the earth. And in that process, when we move from, from earth to heaven, our bodies will be transformed from our earthly bodies because our earthly bodies cannot, uh, of course, fly. And, you know, there's something that will happen in that process that will be part of the rapture. So what is the rapture? And how do we end up with this word rapture? Because the Bible doesn't use the word rapture. Um, but, you know, everywhere you turn, even non-Christians don't know the word rapture. Hollywood has movies about it, and, um, you know, there's so much out there. Um, I, I pray this study will help us to examine what the rapture is, define it, and defend it biblically, and explain its personal and, and practical um, application and importance in our life. So does the Bible use the word rapture? No, the Bible does not uh, use the exact word rapture, like in many translations, uh, the, the Greek and the original Hebrew in the Old Testament and Aramaic in parts of the New Testament um, uses words that, um, that have to be translated into our modern language in a way that we can understand. And so rapture is one of those words that does not really occur in the English Bible. It's a ter terminology used to describe a word or words that have that concept of being raptured. So the word raptured um, literally means to be snatched away or to take away or taken. And uh, it is uh, found in First, first Thessalonians 4, the scripture that I read. It is based on the Greek word hapazo, which lit literally means to seize upon, to snatch away. And this was changed to the Latin word rapamur, from which the English word rapture was derived. So, you know, uh, with all the translation from, from Greek to Latin and into English, then you get this word rapture. 
But that Greek word hapazo, like many other Greek words, have different meanings and um, different words for the same meanings too sometimes. But this word, Greek, Greek word hapazo mean, uh, occurs 14 times in the New Testament. And it has four variations of meaning, depending on which portion of scripture it is used. First, meaning is to carry off by force, by force. So Christ will use his power to remove living and deceased believers from the last enemy death. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who are dead will precede us to meet Christ in the air. And so many people are wondering, so does it mean that if the dead meet Christ first, that, that when they die, they don't meet the Lord uh, uh, face to face. No, no, no. The day in Christ means the, the body, you know. The Bible tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We are made spirit, soul, body, right? So when we die, our spirit can no longer live in this body. It goes back to be with the Lord. Hence, Jesus on the cross, when he turned to the criminal, he said, today you shall be with me in paradise. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So, so the day you die, your spirit extends to be with God. And um, when the rapture happens, what happens is that uh, there will be the bodily resurrection of what remains in your body. Some people have a problem with it. Say, you know, that in that case, I should be buried. Let me put it this way. If you were buried 2,000 years ago, there will be nothing left of you anyway. Perhaps one minute dust. And I don't have a problem with that because God created us from dust. It doesn't say how much dust. I think one minute portion. We understand DNA. All God needs to do is to just find one strand of DNA and raise that body and the body will meet your spirit in the air. So that's, that's part of the um, first meaning of hapazo. Second hapazo means to claim for oneself eagerly. Christ purchased us with his blood. And when he comes back for us, he's claiming to himself his, those he redeemed. So that's the second meaning. Third meaning of hapazo means to snatch away speedily. The rapture will occur in the twinkling of an eye. You know what's the twinkling of an eye? That word is used to describe the speed of light. 186,000 miles per second. Right? So, uh, in the twinkling of an eye. Fourth, hapazo can mean to rescue from the danger of destruction. Uh, and so for those who, who, who believe that the rapture will take place before the seven-year tri tribulation, it is to rescue us from the danger of the destruction that will be unleashed on planet Earth during the tribulation. And we're going to talk about that more. So did Jesus, Jesus say anything about the rapture? There's a segment of uh, uh, Christianity and among some theologians who say that Jesus never ever said anything about the rapture. It is only a Pauline theology. And that's, that's a problem there because um, there's an implication that if Paul said it, Jesus didn't say it, that Paul was wrong and Jesus was right in not saying it. In so doing, they are actually calling into question the inspiration of the Bible. They don't understand that. And I've read many, many, I've spent uh, probably six months now studying this whole theology of rapture and, and uh, you know, all the different aspects. And, and, but I believe that Jesus in Matthew 24 was very clear in talking about the rapture. Uh, Matthew 24 verse 40, because the whole of Matthew 24 is about the end times, about rapture, about different things. And, and here he alludes to, to the fact that two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, and the other one left. I mean, like, how, how, how would you understand that? Two person, one's taken, the word taken, you know, hapazo, and one is left. Two women grinding at the meal, one taken, the other left. And then he says, watch therefore, you do not know when the hour is. To me, that's a very clear picture of the rapture. You know, all of a sudden, one person disappears. Come on. I mean, we're not talking about magic here. We're talking about something in reality that happens. And um, so I believe Jesus spoke about it very plainly, very clearly. And of course, uh, the English word for taken in that passage is the Greek word parambano, which uh, in, in, in John 14, 3, uh, John is referring to the rapture. Same word in John 14, 3. Um, and of course, you know, Jesus hints in that passage of Scripture. He makes reference to, to uh, Noah and Lot. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, so what is the rapture? The rapture is perhaps the most important piece of prophecy for us to understand since it could very well impact us and it will impact us personally if you do not die first. 
before the rapture. So the rapture is an event where all who have put their trust in Christ, Bible-believing, born again, where the living or deceased will be suddenly caught up from the earth, caught up into the air to be joined with Christ. The rapture is an event where believers in Christ are taken away from the extreme tribulation and destruction before it overwhelms the world. And hence, this creates uh, the question for those who are pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip, you know, this is a tribulation thing. There are those who believe that, yes, we will be, uh, you know, majority today believe that we will be taken up, raptured before the tribulation. Some believe halfway through. Some believe after the seven years of tribulation. Um, but if you look at similar patterns in the Old Testament uh, and, and the same word rescue from destruction uh, that I used earlier on, uh, on the fourth application of the w- Greek word hapazo, you know, notice that it is made in reference again to the pattern of the Old Testament. The Bible always shows us patterns and types. And there's always a pattern in the Old Testament that God will rescue and God will remove from tribulation, from destruction, from affliction, a major uh, destructive event, God will remove them before it happens. And so we see Noah and his family, the flood. God removed them, put them, and protected them. Lot and his family, before Sodom and Gomorrah, was destroyed. God, literally, angels dragged them out. And of course, Rahab, before Jericho was taken, you know, um, Joshua's uh, soldiers went in and rescued her and her family and then total destruction. So that's the pattern there that God will take us out before the major outbreak of destruction and violence. And I pray that this is what happens. We don't really know for sure. The Bible is not clear about it. But based on some of these patterns, I believe, you know, personally, that, that God will take us before the tribulation takes place. I mean, my own personal uh, desire is that... Um, I I don't die. You know, before I die, God takes us, you know, how nice if tomorrow uh, God comes and he says, okay, let's, you know, it's time, it's time up. I'll rapture everybody. Then, then I won't have to go through any more chemo treatment. (laughs) I don't have to look forward to even the prospect of surgery. All of us will be in the presence of God. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, but I mean, we don't know. The Bible is not clear about all those things. The patterns are there. And so, you know, I'll just teach it as I see fit and see uh, based on what God has shown in his pattern, what is clear, we talk about it, what is unclear, we declare that yes, this is not clear, you know, but for sure there will be a rapture. So, so why does the Bible teach about the rapture anyway? If he's not going to present us with all the, the times and the sequences, why? Why put one more thing out there that creates some problems and even some uh, uh, reasons for dissension and disunity in some churches. So why, why does the Bible teach? Why is it so important that Jesus had to, to talk about it and Paul had to deal with it? He says, I don't want you to be ignorant. That's the first reason. So the Bible deals with the issue of rapture so that he doesn't want us to be ignorant. Notice he doesn't want us to be left in the dark like the rest of the world. When it happens, we're like, Whoa, what's happening? Right? I mean, if you get caught up tomorrow and you're like, what's happening to me? You know it's the rapture. So he doesn't want us to be ignorant too, so that Christians would have hope that when the world is in a hopeless turmoil. You know, we're living more and more in this, in this cauldron, in this mess of, of, of anarchy, of, of violence, of, you know, uncertainty. And we need some hope. We need something to hold on to, to look forward to. And so God... I guess, you know, left us with this understanding, this knowledge of rapture, so that we will not sorrow as others who have no hope. You know, the people who do not have Christ, they would mourn and they would be sorrowful because they'd be like, wow, it's hopeless. You know, the world, the climate is getting worse and worse. You know, every summer, more and more fires. Every winter, storms. All kinds of natural disasters. The sea is rising. The storms are getting worse. There's no hope for them. You know, there's nothing to look forward to. But for Christians, we have this hope. Tomorrow he might come, and I'll be caught up, and everything will be perfect from then on. So 
finally, so that Christian will find comfort in what is to come. And of course, at the end of 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, it talks about the rapture. It says, therefore, comfort one another. And so even as I teach this, I'm comforting you. I'm telling you, you know, things may look so bad, things may look so impossible, and, and we might even come right up to the point where, where another war breaks up, Russia takes Ukraine, NATO goes in and fights, and it starts a world war, China invades, Taiwan, all these are possibilities, war breaks out everywhere. Where do you look when there's no end to that? You look up and you say, God, there's hope in you. And so, the, the, the rapture could happen today. That's where Jesus talked about it. Why, why could it happen today? Because the rapture is a signless event. It doesn't tell us that these things will happen and then the rapture will come. It says there's no sign. The sign of the end times are there, but the sign of the rapture itself. It's called the doctrine of imminency. In other words, it could happen any moment. It's the doctrine of imminency. That means we don't know when it could happen. Without warning, it could be tonight, it could be tomorrow, it could be a month later. I don't know. It is a signless event. The rapture is a surprise event. It's a surprise event. Only, only God knows. Only He has the timing. But the issue is this. We should not be surprised. We should be ready for it at all times. Thirdly, the rapture is a sudden event. When it takes place, there's no second chance for people to say, wait, wait, wait. I want to accept Christ now. When it happens, either you're caught up or you're left behind. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Like I said, twinkling refers to the amount of time for light traveling at 186,000 miles per second to be reflected on the retina of one's eye. That's how long it takes. In a split second, in a nanosecond, the Lord will himself appear and he will shout the trumpet will go one moment i'm here next moment we're all up in the air whoa what a day it will be can't wait for that and of course i want to talk about the difference because a lot of people don't, don't realize that actually there are two events that the bible talks about here there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming of christ there's a difference the rapture are often confused with the second coming of christ Yes, in the, general, uh, in the general scheme of things, in a big picture, that is the second coming of Christ. The rapture takes place. We get caught up with him in the air. He takes us to heaven. The earth is vacated of Christians. Tribulation hits. Everything goes crazy. And then finally, after seven years, when things couldn't get even worse, Jesus comes back with us to rule and to totally transform everything. And so... The rapture is when Jesus returns to remove the church and all believers from the earth. First Thessalonians 4 talks about that. And of course, the bodies will be resurrected of those that have died to unite with their spirit in the air. The second coming is when Jesus, again, after seven years, after the tribulation, he, he returns with his saints, with all of us now in victory to destroy the Antichrist, to destroy evil, and to establish this millennial kingdom where we will rule with him for a thousand years. So the important differences between the rapture and the second coming are as follows. And this is where the difference is. At the rapture, believers meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, the believers that have met with the Lord are in heaven now, they return. And the second coming of the Lord to establish his rule on earth. The second coming occurs after the great and terrible tri tribulation. The rapture occurs before it, where we are taken away, before the earth goes crazy and the world self-destructs. The rapture is the remover of believers from the earth as an act of deliverance. The second coming, when he comes again, is the removal of unbelievers for the final judgment. Now everyone is brought before God in his final judgment. The rapture will be secret and instant. One moment you're here, next moment they're gone. And that's where you see in movies, a pilot is flying, and if he's a Christian, he's raptured, he's gone. 
you know, can you imagine the confusion? Everybody wondering, missing persons, millions are missing. The second coming, the Bible says, all will see when Jesus comes. With all his angels, with all of us, the whole world will see. And the second coming of Christ will not occur until other certain end time events take place. Whereas the rapture is imminent any time now. Nothing needs to be fulfilled. He could take us any moment. So that's the difference. Uh, Billy Graham, in his uh, Billy Graham uh, Evangelistic Association, has an article, What is the Rapture? And uh, uh, you can read that. Uh, but I've kind of like um, summarized it into three points. He will come for believers concerning the rapture, both living and the dead in the rapture. Uh, two, after a period of seven years of tribulation, Christ will return to the earth with his church, the saints who were raptured, and see many other evangelical Christians believe that Christ's return and the rapture will not occur. Until, you know, this is where uh, there's the different arguments out there, whether it is pre the tribulation, in the midst of the tribulation, or after. And to me, that's not really important because if God will allow us to go through it, it must not be that bad, and God's grace will be enough. But personally, based on all the scriptures and everything else, I believe He will come for us based on the pattern in the Bible. We don't need to all agree on every detail concerning all the different uh, views of a rapture, uh, pre trip, mid trip, you know, the millennial rule, and all that. But we can agree that Christ is coming back for us, and that, you know, that's the hope of our, 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 our Christian faith in Him. So what's the Christian's response to the rapture? One, the timing of the rapture is determined by God. So it's outside the control of the believer. You and I don't control it. So there's nothing that we can do to change this timing. We, you know, I, I don't believe we can pray and, and even change the timing of God. Yes, you know, I know we don't want to suffer any longer. and Some of us want to be back in heaven. Some of us want to hang around a little bit longer. So it really doesn't matter. God has his own timing. He controls. There's little... Uh, that we can do. So what we can do is to focus on what we can control. We can't control the day, the time, the moment. We can control our preparation during these end times. We've got to be ready because if it's imminent, are you ready tonight? Are you ready tomorrow morning to go when the trumpet sounds? So focus on what you can control. Focus on the main thing. What did Jesus tell us to do before he left? He said, I'm coming back, but in between my going and coming back, preach the gospel make disciples. So let's focus on that and let, not get caught up with all that's happening around us in the world today. Three, find comfort and peace in the knowledge that God has a plan to evacuate us when things get out of control here on planet Earth. I like the word evacuate. You know why? Because recently we saw in Afghanistan when all of a sudden the U.S. pulled all their military out of Afghanistan and many, many Americans, many Canadians, many civilians were left stranded. In Afghanistan, they're like, whoa, our government didn't inform us, our government abandoned us, here we are stuck in the worst situation. That's not going to happen. God will never do that. He says, I'm going to evacuate you before it gets worse. So just know that. Find peace and comfort in that. He's, he's going to be with us. He will never abandon us. And the chron chronological sequence and manner of end time events are not clearly revealed through scriptures. Some are clear. Timing, events, sequence may not be, be clear. But what is clear, we can work on it. What is unclear, we don't speculate. And so don't waste time speculating and struggling to find out what God chose to keep under wraps. I remember, you know, when I was younger and, and even when I was older, whenever we had this subject in Bible study in our church on end times, you know, the, the debate will become an argument and an argument will become a fight. And friends become enemies. People who were best of friends became worse of enemies over these things. And I'm like, why? You know, that's so silly. Don't waste time. Don't waste energy. Don't break up relationships because of that. Speculation is just speculation. Two, don't create disunity and infighting in church over these theological issues that make no difference in your salvation, in your standing in God. Whether Jesus comes before tribulation, in the middle of tribulation, or after the tribulation. It's not going to make a difference if you are born again, you are born again. If you're ready to meet Christ, you're ready to meet Christ. But if you're not, then you better get your life ready. You see, that's, that's the main thing that we need to look at. 
And for further study of the subject, I would recommend you, you know, um, I've, I've um, enclosed there um, two links. One, the Revelation Prophecy Chart by Dr. J David Jeremiah. He's one of the um, most well-known Bible teachers in America, and he talks a lot about the end times, and he's given a chart, on a, a prophetic chart on the sequence, and it's quite clear. And, and of course, my dear good friend, Dr. Tony Evans, uh, in the rapture of the church, I uh, enclosed the URL the, uh, to the YouTube. And this is the clearest, the most um, biblical. And uh, just in 30 minutes, Dr. Tony Evans describes and teaches about the rapture. I've listened to so many. I've studied so much. I've read so many books. But this is the clearest presentation of the rapture. So if you want to know more, go listen to that. I'm sure that it will encourage you. It will enlighten you. And it will prepare you for the rapture and for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you. May he strengthen you. May he give you grace and strength to live the life that is victorious and glorifying to our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.